tell me about the Cody? Uh, they're talking bears. That's all I know. However, if you examine these fascinating rocks here, they... Never mind. When the Great Storm had finally passed, the Coden saw their gift from Coda. Great sections of the seas had frozen, creating floating islands of ice, and the Coden climbed onto these, and so now could live upon the land and the sea. And they watched, and they learned, and they hunted. The Coden build and maintain cities of ice known as sanctuaries. These sanctuaries float on restless seas far to the north, beyond the lands where the Norn have travelled. These sanctuaries are spiritual havens as well as shelters, and at their icy core, the voices live in shrines to Coda. In order to teach enlightenment, maintain a sense of distance from the world, and meditate on Coda's true wishes, each sanctuary's voice shuts themselves off from the world. Only the battle leader of each sanctuary, the Claw, has the right to approach the voice and ask for guidance. That guidance and spiritual wisdom is then brought back for the benefit of every Coda in the tribe. However, with the rise of the elder dragon Jormag, the great ice ships of the Coden were driven apart. Some fled to the north, others were capsized, torn apart, and destroyed by the dragon's wrath. Some few escaped southward, cut off from their fellows by the destruction and rising tide. The land to the far north cracked and shattered with Jormag's waking, allowing the icy northern ocean to flow through and create new inland seas on which the Coden were cast adrift. Man, this map is so gorgeous. Look at it. Look at the colors of the sky and the snow. Amazing. Uh, as pretty as it is, we're in some danger. Hello, everybody. We are in the far climbs of the Shiver Peaks, way off into the north at Watchful Fjord here. We're at the entrance to a city, a Coden Sanctuary, an iceberg that they have capped in and uh, sort of steered like a great ship from the far north as they flee the Elder Dragons, uh, one in particular, Jormag, and now it's sinking. So this entire thing we're standing on right now, you've got to think of something steadily going down. It makes me think, oh, obviously we don't see the movement here, so you've got to think of it as a slow burn, a bit like, um, there's this YouTube video, right? It's fascinating to watch of the Titanic sinking in real time. It's like a two hour long video and you're just watching it. Very little's going on, but you slowly see the movement. Yeah, think about that here as well. You know, it's just this enormous vessel, this enormous craft, and Air Sagalkin very recently has rushed on past us, and she uh, is trying to save these people. But it's such a crazy disaster. It, the idea is it's nuts for anyone to even try and save them, and Air's being a bit reckless with her own life. You might think that's crazy, that she's sort of throwing her life away, as is suggested in the mail that sent us up here. But one thing you've got to understand about Norn is, Norn care about their legend and their legacy, and what their actual life is less important to many of them than the stories they leave behind. So if Air fails against Kralkatorik, feels like she hasn't got much left, but she can do this one great thing, at least she'll be a legend in some way, right? And it may seem bizarre to us as an audience, but you've really got to use your imagination and hone in on this idea that the different playable races are very different cultures and peoples and societies. They're not all just reskinned humans, and the Norn deserve to be a bit more. So I actually love this story beat that Air's gone a bit off the deep end, right? Maybe even literally. <laughs> the code in themselves are pretty fascinating, and over this dungeon experience, uh, we'll learn a lot about them. Here's one guy, Frost Revel. Take care where you step around here. The ice is unstable and could give way at any moment. These icy depths and the creatures that infest them are eager to pull you down with them. That's a cool, creepy idea. That all this ice that's melted is now being inhabited by Jormag's minions. They assure me that the end of the world has not come, but with all the destruction and death, I find I do not believe them. My world is crumbling around me. This is a really sad comment. At launch Guild Wars 2, it's like, yeah, the world isn't ending. It's amazing how this comment uh, can be taken as the story progresses and progresses and progresses. Let me tell you guys. What will you do? Wait for my own death. And in the meantime, swim like a fool through the frigid waters at the world's end. I'm not hopeful, but neither am I suicidal. So the entrance to this dungeon 
is different to fire hearts right where we had the citadel of flame with this one the devs forced us to do the meta to enter it and indeed on the next dungeon as well they'll force us to do a meta to enter and indeed on the final dungeon they force us to do a meta to enter it so why is it this one sandwiched between the others at the end doesn't have that it's a very good question i genuinely think there's probably a cut pro premise or concept for a meta event leading into this there is a huge meta in the area to do with a champion of uh, jaw mags, but it's not connected to the dungeon. And I wonder why the devs did that. I'd love to pull one of their ears on that one day about how this ended up not having a meta. If, a if any of the dungeons really need one as well that gives clarifying context, I think this one does. This is supposed to be a sinking city ship, a sinking sanctuary. And yet when we speak to these NPCs out here, they don't really, you know, talk about it much. And, that you know, they deliberately kind of have to keep it a bit empty feeling. So anyway, something to think about. Let's go on in and we can start off with the story itself and talk a little bit about build craft. Because Caraflower's got nearly everything she needs, but there's a little bit more to talk about still. So the Coden Sanctuary ship is under attack by Jormag's minions. Air and Kaith are rushing to save it before it's too late. Well, Kaith isn't necessarily... She's rushing to save Air, and that means that she does both, I guess. In we go. Into story mode level 76. Um, and we'll see what we got. Well, so the weather immediately changes a little bit. It's really cool. I actually adore this dungeon in terms of the environment. It's one of my favorite in the game just because there's so many twisting passageways and cool places that we can explore. So, uh, yeah, let's walk up a tiny bit. Now, uh, I want to talk about traits. Last episode, you saw we picked up the final line. You've learned nearly everything there is to know about Necro. Soul Reaping, which was all about giving us more life force and all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, just a little bit more to look at here, and that's the mages. And we're going to pick two of them first, right? First of all, we've got these choices here. I'm going to pick up Soul Marks, which is marks, which are our staff skills, if you remember. This is a mark. This is a mark. This is a mark. Similar to how Scepter has a Grandmaster trait, Staff has a trait as well, but it's not GM. It's just a bit lower, right? So our marks become unblockable, which is okay. But the more important part here for me is that they generate life force when triggered. So, Caraflower is going to really struggle to solo this dungeon. Uh, she needs to be able to re-sustain really heavily. But Necros can't really heal themselves much. At least they can bring themselves lots of life force. So, as long as I'm hiding in Shroud when the big attacks come in, we can use a trait like this to bring all of our life force back up. And it's kind of like a substitute for healing, right? So, Soul Marks. Uh, and then the other one I'm going to show you here as well is this. Fear of Death. Your fear effects have increased durations. 100% increase. So I pick up this trait and I double the length of all of my fears. What does that mean? We've also doubled our terror damage, right? So you get a huge synergy off of terror here and fear of death. Fantastic. And then um, the other fa facet of this as well is if I fear someone, I get 15% of my life force straight away. So I kind of heal myself for 2,200 health every time I fear if I'm using life force correctly, in a way, right? So really, really, really nice. And that's going to be a super important combo for us, terror and fear of death. Um, so yeah, cool. Uh, now, climbing up. What do we got? Well, we got the waypoint. Look up there. That looks so cool, doesn't it? Uh, there is an anvil for repairing if we die and our armor breaks, but that's not something we've really seen so far. And immediately, you'll find Air and Kaith are together. This isn't like when we ran after Zodja in uh, Sorrow's Embrace, and we kind of had to get a bit deep before we found her. These two are just here straight away. Hey, Kaith. Um, I heard you were coming, and so I'm pretty happy. It's been a while. The world is for exploring. What does she have to say? I'm glad you're here. I think we should keep an eye on air, she says. Well, well what's going on? The Coden are a refugee race. This ship was their sanctuary. It's now sinking. And one of their leaders, their voice, is trapped within. The claw here is her companion. So, yeah, the, the Coden have this beautiful idea of their leadership. One hides inside and supposedly communicates with their god through the mists. And then the military leader and the, the, is the one that kind of speaks to people and translates that and actually is more forward-facing. So, here's the claw, but the voice, who knows where they are, deeper in. Uh, then we should go. Air, what's going on? You sure about this? Gather your allies. It is time for one last great hunt. Look at this last hunt. What's going on? The, the Coden ship is sinking. One of their leaders, the voice, is still within. We need to rescue her, for the ship is a swarm with Jormag's minions. A swarm? That's a cool word, man. Uh, what minions? I don't see any. Ice Brood have infested the ship. The dragon's champion is raining frozen death down on us. And there are powerful sons of Svana here. Okay, so really try and keep this clear in your minds, guys. 
of the, you know, the entities circling around the Elder Ice Dragon, you have Ice Brood, which are the minions he directly creates. And also there are Sons of Svanir, who are Norn that have started following the dragon and like willingly sort of becoming like half Ice Brood, if you will. So we've got a mix of all kinds. Sons of Svanir and Ice Brood together. All right, John, my servants don't frighten me. But what about me? What do you mean? One, one last great hunt. What about Zaitan? What about your friends? What about the other dragons? I'm no longer the warrior that I once was, she says. Zodja herself said that. And yeah, if you go back to that last dungeon, I know it was a little while ago now, uh, you'll see like, and, and Ayr's just had setback after setback after setback. Everything she's done, like even way back to gathering the sword in Aslan Cat Camps, everyone's just spat at her in the face. The only person who hasn't is Kate, who still, to this point, is with her. Uh, sh uh, Zodja herself said that. Better to go out as a hero than fade away. Surely you don't believe what an Asura says. Zodja speaks what others think. I've heard the whispers. Since Destiny's Edge failed, I've been a ghost of my former self. I disagree, but that shouldn't keep us from helping the Kodan. Maybe, but what if this is just crazy for all of us? Uh, so yeah, we kind of get locked into this. This is the staging ground as always. All the doors and things are closed. Now, I just want to point out this door straight away. This is off to an explorable path, and there's a ton of these in this instance and this dungeon. We constantly see uh, explorable hints that maybe we'll be looking at later. Uh, I love the colours as well, by the way. There's about going to be about a thousand times I'm tempted to say it over this video, so I'll just say it now. I love the reds on the whites. I think it's awesome. Okay, Honor's Claw. So you're one of the leaders of this place, huh? Where's your companion? Time is of the essence. Jormag's champions have crippled our ship. It is sinking. Okay, we're all here. Let's go. Why have we come here, Air? Our ship is under assault by the servants of Jormag. The voice, our spiritual ruler, is going mad. We must save her. This is suicide. Let us come back with more people. No. Time is of the essence. I will go alone if I have to. You'd be throwing your life away. None of the others seem to care if I live or die. Let my legend come to its end. We must go now. I fear for the voice. This is a fool's errand, Air. And I am a fool. Man. Okay, so the dialogue is really short and snappy in this dungeon. And sometimes I wonder whether it was because the devs were majorly time crunched. In fact, uh, despite the way I really love the way that this dungeon looks and it's my favorite environmentally, this dungeon is possibly, like, in terms of the gameplay and stuff, one of the lowest quality things the devs put out. And I will show and demonstrate that to you very clearly as we go forwards here. But that short, snappy, almost rushed feeling dialogue... Then I am a fool. Uh, it almost kind of works there, I think. It's kind of powerful for area uh, in this situation. So as we walk up to that gate, we're going to go through it. Last little bit about our build now is the final Grand Master. I'm going to pick this up. It's called Doom Fire. Remember how this changed one of our scepter skills? This changes our Shroud Auto Attack. So just to be clear, the Shroud Auto Attack is here. Life Blast. It's the little pellet of damage that, you know, fires out and cleaves people. You see this here? We can keep doing it. Well, this, and that's just flat damage. Now, Shroud 1 inflicts Burning. Burning is the single hardest hitting condition in the game. Well, outside of Terror, actually. Fear is if you pick up Terror. But it's a normal condition, and this can stack intensity while, while Fear can't. That stacks duration. So Burning's really, really powerful. We equip this, and we get very, very powerful uh, auto attacks for Condi builds in Shroud. So that's nice. Um, then also, Blood. I'm not using Blood for this dungeon. We're actually going back to Spite. And you've already seen all the spite stuff. So spite is great for might. It's great for hitting people at low health. And then what I'm going to pick up here is a bit of chill. So whenever we chill someone, we make them vulnerable, which means that terror hits harder and the burning hits harder and stuff. We're going to pick up dread, which is our third fear augment. Inflicting fear on a foe applies vulnerability, and we deal increased damage to foes inflicted with fear. So now, when I cast this and I fear someone... I put 10 vulnerability on them, which means that Terror does 10% more damage and all my other condies and stuff do 10% more damage. So we're running Terror, Dread, and Fear of Death all together. It's the three, it's like the ultimate fear build. It's a really cool idea, right? Uh, and then for the Grandmaster, what I'm going to pick up here is the Signet trait. And what this was, was Signets just get stronger, but also they cool down really quickly while you're in Shroud. So if I cast my heal here, you know, it could take ages to get that heal back. But if I just go in Shroud for a bit, Number one, we get the passive back instantly, which is really awesome. And then when we look back, you'll see it's coming back really quickly here. So really, really strong trait. Lastly, as great as Lingering Curse is, we're going to, uh, for curses that we've seen in awe recently, I'm changing that to Parasitic Contagion. Now, this is a Grandmaster I haven't talked about yet. 
which is a percentage of our condition damage heals us. So the whole idea here is we bomb them so hard with fear and crazy condi damage, especially in AoE scenarios, that we get healed really massively and we sustain. We're going to use life force to sustain. That's how we're going to get through the dungeon. I'm going to use epidemic uh, against uh, groups of enemies. We're going to use corrosive poison cloud against groups of enemies. And also we're going to use the well of darkness sometimes too, which blinds AoE. And then... We could even run blind, to makes people chilled, and then chill makes people vulnerable, but we won't worry about that. So yeah, that's kind of the idea, and then on occasion we'll sub on some other signets as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so, it's a real ch I'm, I'm kind of nervous about this, because, I mean, the dungeons of a lot of the dungeons have been really challenging. Uh, the last one we did uh, was, was much more comfortable. This one uh, has some really scary stuff, including right here at the beginning. So, let me roll up my sleeves. Literally rolling up my sleeves here. Uh, last to talk about is food, uh, which I almost forgot actually. Uh, so we're going to be eating this level 80 food here I've just picked up. This didn't actually exist at launch. It was from uh, a festival a bit later, but it's approximating a launch thing, I think. Anyway, uh, koi cakes we're going to eat, which is 100 expertise for higher condition durations and also a bit of condition damage. And then I'm also going to use this uh, toxic focusing crystal which is uh, gain condition damage based on our power and gain condition damage based on our precision. And our loot has condition damage, power, and precision on it, right? Uh, well, our gear, sorry, our loot. So there you go. That's the whole uh, the whole setup. These guys are saying their stuff, but we can catch up with them again in a second. Let's move up to the door where immediately a fight's going to begin. Uh, and there's going to be a huge horde of mobs. They're not all super dangerous. Only a couple of them are. What I'm going to do is hide in one of the pits near the sides of these um, stairs, which will line of sight all the mobs around into a ball into my AoEs. Okay? Slay those who oppose dragons. So here we're going to do this. We're going to drop the corrosive poison cloud to stop their projectiles. Get the fear field down. Um, and then just wait for them to barrel in. We're going to drop our uh, play glands here, the elite. And now we're just going to condi bomb the hell out of them. Hide in this. We're going to epi. So you can see here there's two big dangerous enemies. Two seers. But I've condi bombed them all hard enough that now they're both kind of dying. I epied from one to the other. And there you go. They're dead. Sweet. So... That's the first little wave there, and uh, the very opening of the dungeon. The Seers, uh, basically, you're just looking for whenever there's an elite, and they're the big main target. Uh, that was pretty cool, and you can only imagine how much crazy crap there was we had down there. Now we're going to have another mini instance that's really kind of annoying, uh, and requires us to change pretty much all of our skills and gear and build idea, almost, right? I'm going to sub on minions now. Yeah, seriously. We're going to go, except the flesh golem, I guess, because of our elite here. We're going to go minions. So the next encounter is going to ask us to kill a crystal that cannot be condition damaged. So we're going to use minions to take aggro away from us while we do flat damage. And then we're going to run away every time we get really low. So this is actually quite a risky part of the dungeon. Uh, but a lot of the dungeons risky, so exaggeratedly so, I'm not too sure. Right, so we're going to try and... Con uh, so here, I'll just show you. We'll move in to the pavilions of meditation. And here you see an ice spike comes down. So the ice spike is dropping these projectiles that are constantly rippling out. And what's also happening is it spawns these elite ice brood elementals. We're going to be dealing with these ice brood a ton here. So get ready. Uh, I'm going to ignore the elementals as much as I can. Except to apply conditions to them so that I can heal and resustain so I can keep hitting the, the spike. One of our strongest power hits is actually just the auto attack Doomfire here. And it gives us a bit of might too. So I'm just going to keep autoing this to try and break through the spike. It's a really cool idea, by the way. Did you hear that roar as it landed? That's the idea that that is uh, Jormag's minion in the sky, the dragon that's nearby, dropped it down on us. And the idea is, you know, he's responsible for this attack party. So yeah, we're gonna, now that we ran out of Shroud, I'm using my marks here from that trait to rebuild Shroud, and the auto attack gives us more, and now I'm gonna go back into Shroud again. And the idea is, I'm only really being attacked by one of these elementals right now, the others are hitting my minions and stuff. And we've got until my minions die, and then we'll, we'll have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, this also does a lot of damage, but requires us to go melee, and the Ice Breed Elementals have a really dangerous melee ability I don't kind of want to talk about just yet. So yeah, we'll do that, and now it's our job to rebuild again. And when I drop my Mark V, you see we get a ton of life force because of our trait that I was talking about before. 
So we're just going to slowly cleave this down, making sure that we've got lots of health from parasitic contagion and the ice spike will break. You might be wondering why I don't kill the ice elementals. It's because they infinitely respawn. Sorry, I was trying to say that at the start of the fight. So you can blow all your cooldowns and then it doesn't matter. Everywhere on the ship. I should be at the voice of sight. We must go to her chamber now. All right. Okay. So good. We'll cleave this out. Now that the crystal is dead, you can kill the elementals. And we're over. And look at this. When the crystal breaks, you get this big, beautiful effect that plasters like snow around. Is that what I just saw? Was this snow always here? Anyway, it looks awesome. And, uh, and yeah, so there you go. That's kind of mini encounter number one dealt with. And we can get our regular skills back on. So we're going to go with the Signet. We're going to go with the Corrosive Poison Cloud. We're going to go with Epidemic. And we're going to go... So next, we're going to fight a champion that can't be blinded anyway. So instead of this, I'm going to use uh, Blood is Power. So, a very quick reminder. Blood is power gives me and the things around me might. But it also bleeds my opponent really hard. Look at that. It's four seconds of bleed for 11,000 damage. That's a huge amount of bleeding. It also bleeds me. And I can use something like Deathly Swarm or Putrid Mark to send that condition back onto them. So, this is like six bleeds plus might. And you can like double cast it and stuff. So, that's why we're using Blood is Power. Um, for bosses, that's going to be the main thing. We kind of got two kits we're going to be cycling through. A AoE kit and a boss kit. Uh, so yeah, brilliant. Alright, that's this room done. By the way, that was a lot smoother than I thought it would be. On all my practice runs of this, I was actually um, uh, not using food at all. So I know it's possible without food. Uh, I'm with it now, hopefully that's the bit of leeway I need to do it while recording. So okay, the door opens, we get two big dangerous targets. Now one is elite, one is champion. So the elite one will get feared and blinded and CC'd and whatever, and we don't have to worry about, and we'll die quicker. So I'm going to focus most, most of my condition damage on that one, the troll. And then what we'll do is we'll epi off of the troll onto the seer every now and then. Then once the, um, the troll is dead, so look, we can push him back towards it, right? Then once the troll is dead later... Uh, here, I, if I dodge that, there we go. That's a good dodge, and we can play glands after it. Now we can pull back a little bit. So the seer summons allies, as you can see. These are more elementals. These ones aren't elite, though. And um, a corrosive poison cloud will stop a lot of their most dangerous abilities. So we'll pull back. If we can epi again here, that'll be really good. So I'm going to use my heal. Uh, we want the passive from it a lot, but, you know, it's not that important. And it looks like my epis weren't too good here. So unfortunately, the seer is actually super healthy. So we're going to just try and keep... Like chills and blinds and fears particularly on the seer to break his break bar as much as possible and in that way So here you see I hid in shroud and the second I came back out my heel was back and in that way we can um, uh, uh, Do as much damage as possible basically so here we'll just condi him as soon as his break bars back We fear him look at this range. We've got right so we've got 25 vuln 25 might on ourselves. There's one reason we have a lot of might that I need to explain to you guys still. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll just keep pressuring through. So this is a seer here. It's literally the same mob with the same kind of abilities that we saw earlier, except at a champion scale. And technically, it's not really one of the major bosses of the dungeon. The, the actual big bosses we're going to be fighting are going to be like legendaries and stuff. So yeah, we stay here. Very healthy, very sturdy right now. Having AoE, Feast of Corruption, would be awesome with Devouring Darkness I showed you recently. But then we lose so much of our extra health from Parasitic Contagion. So it's generally speaking not a good idea. Whew, down he goes. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So we can grab the Sitdil chest from him. Uh, and get some nice stuff. And uh, yeah, we're basically in the next section of the dungeon now. You can see those wolves up there. They can be... A they represent basically an instant death for us, potentially. They're really intimidating looking over there. So let's speak to our allies for a second here now that their dialogue's updated. Um, this guy, the claw, says, We must hurry. The voice should be within her meditation chamber. So, yeah, the idea is the voice always hides in this chamber in the center of the sanctuary that no one gets to visit except the claw to communicate. Who is the voice, we ask? Uh, and he says, each of our sanctuary ships is ruled by both a voice and a claw. She is wisdom. I am strength. You said she's going mad. Yes, the voice communes with Coda. Over time, it drives the voice mad. We must go help her. So this is an interesting thing. The devs are kind of doing two disaster stories at once on sanctuaries. This is the story of a sanctuary being attacked by Jormag's minions. Yes, and the Sons of Svanir. Yes, but also... It's another story of how the Coden's leader, the voice, can sometimes go crazy in the mists and become unreliable, which is a fantastic idea. And the devs seem to just want to do it all at once, all together. So that's what we've got here. 
Um, we must go help her. Of course, where are all the others? Most have abandoned the sanctuary already. Some have remained to protect it. I fear for their lives with these dragon minions and Svanu everywhere on board. Yeah, uh, so uh, let's set this up in our minds. We might find living Coden around on this, this dungeon. There could be some living groups, pockets of resistance out there. Well, I hope to find them. Uh, have you fought the Sons of Svanu before, we can ask? He says yes, though they are in greater numbers down here. They are a people out of balance. So this is an interesting side that maybe there are Norn, sons of Svanir, way up north where the Coden came from. We share a hatred of them. Let's go. Kaith, what's up? I'm worried about Air. How so? She seems grim, and she's taken too many risks. I cannot understand it. Maybe she wants to atone for earlier failures? I love the idea that we're just two Silvari trying to speculate about the rest of the world. That would be foolish. We've all failed in the past. Ah, but you are not Air. She holds herself to a higher standard. Hey, you gotta let it go, lady. Clear skies. She looks so awesome. I don't know whether it's just like the lighting here right now, but damn. Uh, I love the tattoos. Uh, these ice brood are weak and pitiful. Jawmag, bring on your champions. I'm ready to meet my fate. So I think the idea is she's supposed to be like full of adrenaline as we go through here. This isn't the answer, Air. Let me help you. You are helping. Watch what happens here and sing my legend at the council fires. What about these Coden? They are like us, natives of the north, driven south by Jawmag's wrath. I have pledged to help them, as my own former allies care little for me. So, by the way, um, she just said, oh, they're like us. Let's just be very clear about the geography here. In Guild Wars 1, the Norn were here and came south, right? To where we find them now, Holbrack and stuff. We had that little glimpse at. The Coden are even more further so. They're, they're, like, all the way up there, and they're coming down just now, right? They're, like, following in the Norn's footsteps in a weird way. Though, I don't believe... I think they're judgmental enough to not believe that they're following in anyone's footsteps. They're just doing it in the name of balance and stuff. So yeah, she says, my own former allies care little for me. They have kind of been dicks. Others care about you, Air. Yes, Kaith is here, though she does not understand. But I have failed the others too many times. You're too hard. She blames herself for the breaking of Destiny's Edge. What was she supposed to do? Just stamp, stamp her foot down when the Queen contacted Logan? The wounds on that body. I didn't realize she had fallen so far. You're saying the voice attacked other Coda? The rage of Coda assails her mind. We must hurry. So yeah, there were some code and left. This guy here um, is dead though. So you see, this is an interesting wave of Sons of Svanir. Most players who do this dungeon will just charge through. Um, and they won't necessarily see these. They're, they're very weak and they're a minor part. But yeah, check it out. So there is a dead Conan here. But it wasn't even the freaking Sons of Svanir. It was the voice. Scary stuff. Uh, yeah, so, you know, Air's way too hard on herself. Uh, it is a difficult thing, though, because you, uh, you guys have heard the excerpt in the series now already. When Logan decides he's going to leave, Air says, Logan will do what's right. I trust him. And then Logan just leaves. And she's like, oh, that isn't what I was expecting. You know, Air wasn't to know. What was she supposed to have? A complete character understanding of these people early on. Uh, but in any case, yeah, so we are going to start finding bodies. That wasn't the only one. There's another one here. Um, and they've been mauled apart by a familiar Coden. Can you imagine that? Your whole city is sinking and being destroyed and cr crumbling to ruins. Then the leader behind the curtains that you've, like, never been able to interact with. You might even stay to try and save, and they're mad and they kill you. I wonder if there's any connection. Is it just a coincidence that this went mad at the same time as when Jormag was dealing with this stuff? We'll actually find, uh, as, as um, more lore unveils... That Jormag has some pretty interesting connections to the Mist uh, throughout the franchise. So, yeah. Something to think about. A very subtle angle of this. By the way, this Corrupted Ice Turret is 100% skippable. And in all of my test playthroughs, I never actually stayed to kill it. I'm not sure why I'm doing that here with you all now. <laughs> I'm really not. We should have him down. We got 25 might. So, remember, because we're death... Uh, sorry, because we're spite... When someone gets low on health, even a turret like this, it means we just start getting tons of might. That's why we're sitting here at 25. There's another reason we're at 25, and it's because of our runes. I'm using the runes from Cordicus's Manor. Remember those? Aristocracy runes. Now, aristocracy runes got updated very recently in a super recent patch where they have a thing on them now, which means whenever we inflict uh, weakness, we gain might. And as a necro... We, we, we do weakness on Enfeebling Blood. We do weakness on, on Corrosive Poison Cloud. We do weakness when we combo our three Poison Field into our four. We have a fair amount of weakness. We pulse continual weakness with our Elite. So it's kind of like a crazy good might generator, and that's why I'm using those runes. I'm sure there's lots of good runes, but yeah, that's why one of the reasons we have so much. Okay, so we need to climb up. We're actually getting close to the Voices Chamber now. Um, 
it's just around here on the corner. But we do have the wolves. Now, the wolves basically, you see it says lunges and bites. When they aggro you, they, they jump on you and insta-kill you, basically, is the point. The elite ones. So you need to keep them away and have weakness on them before that happens. So I'm going to very aggressively use my marks to put weakness out, which will trigger aristocracy runes. And make sure he uses his leap far away, which if you were very eagle-eyed there, you will have noticed he did. Now that he's close to me, I'm going to fear him away again. And now that we got a lot of condi, I'm going to epidemic. Oh, I got knocked down here. So that's the other wolf just did that. Okay, as you can see here. What I kind of don't want to do is use my elite just yet, because my elite will be really useful in the next engagement. There we had blind, which saved us on that next one. We're going to fear it away again. Just keep the pressure going. Holding these doom file eyes. So you see we're critically hitting for 3k. Yeah, that the uh, the sculpt, the sculpt structures we've been beating, you can't condi or crit, which is one of the reasons that they're so annoying. So anyway, that's one wolf dead. Now we've got the other one to deal with. Okay, that hurt. Pull back. And uh, we just want to cleave it down. The other thing with the wolves is that they summon more wolves the longer that they're alive. So that's good. And now we'll epi again so that we can hit that colossus back there. Pull back through. I still think the Colossus have some of the coolest designs of creatures in the game. And you notice how frequently I can just come back and hide in Death Shroud? Again and again. And again and again. I can keep doing it. Um, it's mostly because we've got so much life force coming from our staff and stuff now that we uh, get a ton when we fear. And this is all pretty recent balance. I honestly think if we had... If this series had been just Caraflower's Adventure and only Caraflower's Adventure and we got here really early... I honestly don't know how easy, easily I could have cleared this out. It would have been tough. Very tough. I wish you well. Yeah, the road is long. Okay, cool. So, uh, walking along. Look at how everything's like slightly tilted. Yeah, and it's all uneven. The idea that it's starting to get a bit lopsided as it sinks and falls away. So, uh, there's a lot of roads. You can actually walk all the way up here. And this will take you back out over, looking over the entrance to the dungeon. I like these exterior dungeons, you know, we haven't had one for a while. Even the Citadel, which kind of was outside-ish, felt very enclosed and indoorsy. And then the rest of them have been pretty traditional dungeons. Uh, moving over, though, we've got more wolves to deal with. The truth is we're going to have to clear all of these creatures out in this area. And because of the way that this build works, in some ways it's better. It's definitely more time efficient to do them all at once. So that's what I'm going to try and do here. There's no elite wolves, so I'm going to mark that guy over there. Then I'm going to mark this guy and hit this. And I'm going to bait them all around this corner here into Plague Lands. Oh, I don't have my um, blind filled up. That's pretty bad. And we can only hit a maximum of five targets. So we want the little guys to die pretty quick here. So we're going to fear that guy away and epi now. And we'll pull them all through like so. And I'm just going to steadily back up here basically now. I'm going to steadily back up. And we're just going to try and maintain focus as best we can. So I'm going to cast Double Blood as Power. And use the Mark IV to transfer all of those bleeds back. You see this guy's got like 17 bleeds on him right now. Pull back through there. Move out of the AoE. Waiting for Epidemic to come back up. Get as much Condi out as possible before the next one. This is a good time. So I'll Epi there. And we hit pretty much everyone with that, I think. Get another Corrosive Poison Cloud out to stop any random autos. Life Force is back, using our five to stack lots of Torment. And we'll just grind them all down. Here I'm targeting the guy at the back and auto-attacking so it goes through. So, like, every attack I do hits multiple targets, right? So, we strike through the Seer. And there you go. That's the, that's the whole group dead. This thing just got spawned, but because it was a summon of the Seer, when it died, uh, it died automatically. Okay, good. Perfect. So, oh, we got another T6 material there, a Vicious Fang. Uh, that's everything, right? Okay, good. For what it's worth, down there as well, there's even more, like, dungeon side branches and stuff. Later, we'll go through that door. But here, can you see this special, like, uh, circle-looking chamber? This is the, the voices chamber. This is where the voice should be and would have been under normal operating procedure. We're at the Chamber of Honor's voice. And it's a gorgeous little winding road. What have we got? Well, so far, all we've fought is Ice Brood. Some Ice Brood Norn, but certainly Ice Brood. No sign of the Sons of Sfarnia yet, right? Ah, well, I spoke too soon. This is the Voices Lair. Who are you? I serve the hunter known as Coden's Bane. Your precious voice is our prey. She can run all she wants, but we'll find her. And turn her into one of Jormag's minions. Now die! So Kulag the Fallen. Uh, he's not 
a minion. He's just a Norn that friggin' loves Jormag and wants to do his Jormag bids. And as you can see, he's hurting us quite bad here. Um, so I'm going to hide in Shroud until that animation goes away. He's put tons of chip, cripple, and tons of chill on us. And uh, so this is kind of boss fight one. Kulag the Fallen. And yeah, there's actually a scouting ahead party of Sons of Svanir. Specifically. Oh, God, that's really bad. Um, that's really terrible. What do I do? I, I, there's a lot of mechanics for me to describe here. I just need to figure out how best to survive until things get better. So here I'm going to attack him basically for a bit. Okay, good. Now he's attacking me. And if I come here, hopefully we'll be all right. So, so um, oh my God, we might die. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. We're down state. We're down state. So we could use Life Leech ordinarily to sap his life force and keep ourselves alive. However, he's obstructed. So I'm just going to use Bandage here. And we're not in that AoE. Okay, good. I think we should be clear now. All right. All right. Okay. So Kulak, what I could also do is I could cast Fetid Ground here on the target and that would go through the wall and it would proc our Signet of Agony to help us res as well and we could do a little bit of extra damage. So Kulag is actually a really, really, really difficult boss but is undermined by one simple fact. He can't move. So he stands here where the voice would normally be and he refuses to get off the platform. You see he's got this like classic version of stability here. It says cannot be pushed back. You can still CC him. What the hell? Why is this triggering over and over? I uh, don't know what to do here. Maybe just double dodge for as many evades as possible. i got to start doing damage. I should have been doing damage anyway because, to be honest, we got to uh, get a move on here. So I'm trying to do damage here so that I heal through Parasitic Contagion. And I should use this as well to an extent. Uh, the heal. And then try and get the recharge back. This is really awful. I never experienced this in testing at all. Um... I'm going to use this to try and resustain as well while we're while uh, we're in shrouds. Uh, Christ. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanics. First, he's got summon Horfrost. That's that giant thing where he's painting the entire room with chills and bl uh, and uh, cripple. He slows us down massively, extends all of our cooldown durations, does a lot of nasty stuff. Horfrost is what's splashing around everywhere. He also has a few other animations. I do want to show you, and I will show you. Uh, where well basically if you go anywhere near him, he pushes you away and he like has a lot of knockback. You can actually see on the flavor text under his name here, it says summons Horfrost and has knockback. Um, so here, look, his break bar's going down. So I'm climbing up. I'm going to trigger this. I'm going to trigger Plague Lands. I'm going to trigger Blood is Power. I'm going to use the four to splash that back on him. And now I'm going to come around the corner again here. So he's got all of these animations that make him really deadly. Our Koi Cake ran out, so let's refresh that. Has it really been that long? Uh, he's got all this stuff that's really deadly, but because he can't move, if you stand in a line of sight area where he can't direct... You see how I'm obstructed? He's also obstructed right now is the point. So uh, for as long as he's obstructed, um, he shouldn't use any animations at all, and you'll be 100% safe. Basically, what I'm saying is you can, in theory, and for all my test plays, this has definitely been possible. You can stand right here. He'll never see you, and he'll never cast a single ability unless you walk around the corner. So it's impossible to lose the fight if you use the right technique because he can't do anything. As you see, he's just staring at me, right? So there you go. I've explained the whole principle. Why I was getting hit earlier as this fight was going along is because I had Kaith, Honor's Claw, and Air with me, and he targeted them. Normally, he just targets the players, and he's happy to forever target the players, and there's, like, no problems there. Here, look, he used Horfrost anyway. This is so bizarre to me. Really, really, really strange. We broke his bar again. I'm going to use the fear there just for terror damage. That's it. And now we're going to move back through. Oh, I should have used terror there as well. As long as we keep spamming the signet, we should be fine. This is really strange that he's using Horfrost. He wasn't before. I think he does need line of sight on someone to try it, but he's at least casting it every now and then. If I can keep a good amount of chill on him, we should be fine. But his chill is slowing down my re-entry into Death Shroud, which is awful, honestly. In fact, I think I might lose. I think I'm about to die. Am I not about to die? I mean, we can always res ourselves. Is it because Air's still alive? It might be because of Air. She's not dead to Horfrost yet. And I think he's randomly retargeting to her every now and then, maybe. Uh, so yeah, you could just stand here and use sideways AoEs to hit him around the corner, right? That's the whole point. I don't even have a target on him right now. Uh, so I'm going to click up here on the top right on the UI. That's a way you can get a target. I really want to do more damage, and normally I'd be way more aggressive. But because we're low on life force, and because we've been low on health the whole time, because of these random Horfrosts, this entire thing is going a lot slower than I was anticipating. 
But I'm just going to stick with it like this. We're going to play as safely as possible. Here you'll see we're regenerating. Uh, there, his break bar's down. Also, our elite skill would ordinarily be up already. But um, he's had us chilled for so long that it's just going really slow. I'd normally get like two elites, maybe. Uh, in fact, less than that, and the fight would be over. But here... He's being a, a, a bastard, basically. A real bastard. Um, also, Epidemic is bad for this fight, and there was no reason for me to bring it. Okay, we go down because of the Hoarfrost. We got to wait now for the animation to end, and all the ticks are damaged to stop hitting me. Now I can press Bandage, and he's had his break bar broken. So now we just have to hope we can trigger... We can fully res before the next Hoarfrost comes down. I think we should. In the event that we can't, we can burst out extra health with fetid ground next time, though. So we're guaranteed to be able to get out. Uh, up, sorry. Okay, so there you go. Um, we're up. I'm going to heal. We're going to get his next break bar down. Oh, we actually got the signet on him. I think he had a line of sight on me for a second there. Normally, I'd be using blood as power and all kinds of stuff, but I'm scared of losing here. We can also hit him with the fourth. Do this, right, which I've been showing you. Just want more fear on him. That's all I want. More fear. That Horforest I probably procced because I was standing in front of him, right? That's perfectly fair. I want to break this break bar, but he's knocking me away. I'm going to try and use the two to get in, apply chill on him, break the break bar, climb in with a plague lands, but I have no endurance to dodge. That's fine. Get the heal up. Okay, because he's standing in plague lands, he's probably dead. Um, I'm playing it a bit fast and loose here, though, so I have to be very... Oh, there you go. He's dead. She's gone. We must find her before this Coden's bane does. The voice and the claw share a bond. I feel her. She is deeper within the sanctuary. She is in great pain. We will find her. We cannot abandon her to Jormag's minions. Oof, awesome. All right, that was a real struggle because his AI was being really weird. You can imagine if I was trying to fight him fairly, just how impossible that would be to do solo. Uh, but yeah, look at this. You've got a little ritual chamber. She'd sit here. Pretty tragic they're not around. That cutscene's a good example of what I meant with the, the dialogue being very quick and short and like stilted almost. Like like they didn't have much time to write the script or ask the voice actors to do much with it. Um, but yeah, so there you go. This is the chamber. And this is actually a bit of a side tangent. We come in here. We realize that the Sons of Svan are here too. Well, we see evidence of it after we've been explained already outside. Do you have any idea what's going on here, Air? Stop and assess the situation. That's what the old Air would do. It's okay to try and offer some words of encouragement. Air doesn't actually respond. And again, I wonder whether that's like missing dialogue. I don't know because she will say something when we get out here. As everybody patrols on through. On his claw is the only one that's got any speed about him here. Come on, guys. <laughs> one set of tracks splits off here. Yes. But we must follow the voice. Her pain calls to me. So here we find some suggestions that the minions have really spread all over the city. We're only going to be focused on, on one specific task here. Uh, which is over here by this door. So you see some new enemies have arrived here. This is our next engagement. Uh, our job is to kill the Goliath to open the door. The Sons of Svarnir next to him are just regular mobs. This is one of the cool examples of just how janky this dungeon is. Like, that boss is a good example as well, I think, honestly. Uh, here, basically, we have some Sons of Svarnir that have maybe, like, a couple of thousand health. Standing next to a boss that has hundreds of thousands. Like, it's so crazy, the tanky, the tank difference between them. So I'm going to play single target variant of the build right now. We won't need Epidemic. So I'm going to put on Signet of Spite. Just for extra solo pressure. Um, there might be other skills that are better, but that's the one I'm going to use here. So we're going to run in with our marks. We're going to fear. We're going to keep them all together. We're going to dodge that. We're going to play glands. We're going to drop the cloud. We're going to drop the signet. We're going to use blood is power once. We're going to use blood is power twice. We're going to transfer that back onto him. And now we'll finish these skills. Go back onto star for these ones and into shroud. Now that his break bar broke right as we have the biggest part of our condi bomb on him. Um, he takes extra damage from that. So this is really, really good here. Uh, he's already down to 70%. As far as his abilities go, you're pretty much safe. Even if you get hit by his biggest attack. It's just a knock knockdown or like a long-term CC, and it's really well telegraphed. The rest of it's autos that he'll never be able to um, do enough damage with to out-pressure our parasitic contagion. So, yeah, we'll just run this. You'll see the animation again in a second. Shall I show you what it looks like when I get hit? Here, I won't get hit by the next one, all right? Um, we'll go into Shroud. Why not? There's the five, the three. Look at this draining. Look at this. There you go. There's the big animation. It's just a knockdown, you see? And that's it. 
That's the whole thing. There's some weird CCs in this dungeon that you can like cleanse with weapon swapping. Uh, this isn't this isn't one of them though. So yeah, his break bar drops again. Do you remember Corticus Manor on Brax where we had to put in so much work just to keep the break bars down? This is what Necro does. I remember when I was showing you Twilight Arbor and just how strong it is, and I made the case that Necro is excellent, but most PVEers don't realise it because they don't kind of play formats of content where it really where it really shines. Uh, well, I'm I'm hopefully demonstrating that to here to you guys again. Like their capacity to just load and oh, it's it's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, this Goliath's got nothing on us, <laughs> really, absolutely nothing. And we even get to kill him in a reasonable amount of time. Perma 25 might, lots of Vaughn, and down he goes. Looks like he had some kind of death whale there. We're done here. But it got interrupted by the cutscene. So, uh, oh, we get an iron axe. Might actually be able to use that on a power build there. Down he goes. The door opens. We get a cutscene showing the next room. This looks like it's going to be a big encounter or a big play space. It kind of isn't in the end. Because as we run through, you'll see it's pretty. It's a big area, right? Like lots of stuff going on. I think one of the explorable paths has us do stuff in here and might make more room of the space. I can just imagine all these big bears sitting around here praying, meditating. It does feel like we're on the lower decks of an old ship, you know. Uh, even though we're in an iceberg. And uh, moving forward, you've got uh, uh, an enemy here. This is Herelva the Lost. So this is a Norn. And there's a beautiful thing that this teaches us in lore. Cripples, chills, reflects projectiles, freezes, transforms. Only two of those are relevant. Reflects projectiles and transforms. Basically, she has an ability where she spins around like a warrior with Axe 5. And what we... Or more pointedly, a ranger. But I can't give that to you guys as a point of uh, comparison because we haven't played a ranger. And basically, he's just going to spin around on the spot and just don't stand next to them. We don't really have much projectile damage, and that's it. Then the transform is going to be another thing, and that will be important. So here, look, even more dead Coden. I guess these ones actually got slain by the Sons of Svano, though. Uh, so I'm just going to go bombing in with as much damage as possible. Same kind of idea, uh, though we do want our food up, so let's grab that. Uh, so here, they have projectile damage too, but our corrosive poison cloud will get rid of that. Ooh, I'm getting hit pretty hard here. There you go. That's the animation. So just stand away from that. Ow, I'm getting really hit hard. This is clearly a projectile. One of my allies just fired at me, I'm sure. Oh my god, why am I dying? What's going on here? I mean, was never, ever, ever, ever hit hard by that boss. Ever. All right, we're just... Look at us healing here, right? So we can't AoE here, so our healing's a bit lower. Jesus Christ. That's crazy. What's happened here? Oh, here I'm auto-attacking myself. All right, we do have a protect projectile. It's the shroud auto, right? And I might have been hitting myself there a little bit. <laughs> okay, so we'll just keep coming down. CPC back up. So at 50% health, watch very closely. Um, Herelva, the lost, will... What if I interrupt right at 50% health? Let's see. Oh, it still did it anyway. There you go. Herelda the Lost transformed. And you'll see now, looks like one of those, well, not a Colossus, but looks, uh, we've seen this before very briefly, an Ice Brood Norn. So we've seen those out in the open world before ages ago. Tyrix actually saw a couple of Ice Brood Norn and we were wondering about how badass and cool they look. So what does a Norn looks like when it's Ice Brood and transformed? This is it. I think that's kind of a speculation people have had. Like, oh, is this what they look like? It, it genuinely is because this boss battle shows us. This is like, you know, most other Norn when they go bear form or snow leopard form or whatever. If you are Ice Brood and corrupted and taken on Jormag's power as you do it, you kind of going to look like something like this. It's so, so cool. I really, really enjoy it. Anyway, in his second phase, he's even easier for my build because he runs around a ton. That was a beautiful roar as he died there, right? Uh, and running around means that he takes extra torment damage. So I'm actually surprised at that. His first phase did more damage to me there than I was expecting. All right, guys, you know what's coming. It's a dungeon episode, which means I sit for a couple of hours and play it. But the video is going to get too long. So I'm splitting this, like all the other dungeons, into two parts. In truth, if every dungeon prior to this had all been one episode each, I'd probably leave this as one too. Just like a massive thing. So I'm going to pause there. I will see you tomorrow. This also gives us more opportunity to dive into juicy Coden lore and blog post uh, uh, explanations about them that doesn't necessarily make it in-game. We are about halfway-ish through the dungeon anyway. Uh, so it's kind of all working out pretty hard. That boss I said might be impossible. Well, we'll be seeing that very soon. Hope you guys enjoyed. See you next time. Those huge ships that the Coden have are magnificent. It's almost enough to make me learn shipbuilding. And where would you sail? Look at how much trouble they're in, even with their floating fortresses. Uh, this trouble won't last forever. Our lives pass quickly. 
though the eternal alchemy can wait for more peaceful times, we cannot. Conan exists in a close community on their sanctuaries, acting in concert and living in peace. They have disputes and disagreements, of course, but they consider themselves above most interpersonal conflict. The balance is more important than an individual's needs. Holy Coda's will, as translated by the voice, supersedes any single Coden's wishes. Each sanctuary is led by two important individuals, the voice and the claw. The voice cares for that sanctuary's spirit, giving them guidance, meditating on Coda's will, and sensing the balance of the sanctuary as the world around it. The claw protects and guards the sanctuary, leading the hunters, or when necessary, the warriors. The claw operates as the physical presence and visible leader, but in fact it is a partnered role. The claw guides the people martially, while the voice remains in a place of safety deep inside the sanctuary. Both are needed to rule. Between these two powerful Coden, the sanctuary is run in a very organized and social style. Each member contributes and works to maintain peace, encourage sharing of resources, and provide support for others within the sanctuary. The Voice and Claw are, essentially, partnered leaders within Coden society. Neither has the right to overturn the other's decisions, and both have clearly delineated spheres of influence. The Voice, spiritual, the Claw, physical. They are chosen at the same time if possible, and serve for centuries together, leading and guiding their sanctuary and the Coden within. If a claw dies, it is tradition for the voice to retire. So too, if the voice should go mad or pass into Coda's arms, will the claw step away and give another his post?